So my main topic today is e-learning tech. What is on the horizon? My agenda then for this uh, brief talk is I like to make this interactive, so to speak, even though it's asynchronous. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, I'd like to tell you who we are at U Sciences. Then I'll be talking about the 2014 Horizon Report and focus in on trends in pedagogy and technology of flipping the classroom. So to make this a little bit interactive, I'd like to ask you which kind of device are you using right now uh, in watching this or listening to this podcast or video as the case may be. So if you're just on audio, you can still participate. Just go to www.rodspulsepodcast.com slash p slash device.html and kindly answer the poll. And... Um, and you'll see what other viewers have also answered once you put in your result. So where is U Sciences? And whenever I give a talk uh, in person, I like to talk about, you know, my sponsor in essence, uh, U Sciences. So um, the second poll is that same URL, except usciences.html. So where do you think U Sciences is? Well, who are we? We are a private, comprehensive, co-educational institution founded in 1821. We were the first school of pharmacy in North America. Um, and I won't read you everything on all my slides, uh, but uh, we're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're very proud of our pharmacy legacy. Some very familiar sounding names uh, were graduates of our College of Pharmacy, uh, then called the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, Dr. Eli Lilly. Uh, Gerald Rohr, William Warner, Robert McNeil, John Wyeth, Silas Burroughs, and Sir Henry Welcome. From the beginning, it's been about discovery, inspiring students to seek, to learn, to innovate. Their curiosity, their love of science, and their passion to discover has helped us grow into a major university. Just as we've evolved, so has our identity. In the 12 short years since we became University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, we've already outgrown the name. Our history and heritage, our unique DNA remain the same, but now it's been transformed into a name and logo that expresses our growth, our broader reach, and our potential for the future. Presenting U Sciences, University of the Sciences, and the growing family of colleges within it. With this dramatic transformation, we are not just showing a new face to the world, we are inviting the world to discover a dynamic new presence, a place where healthcare and science converge. So my next question is, have you ever heard of the Horizon Report? Again, if you wish to take part in the poll, go to www.rodspolspodcast.com p slash horizon dot html. The Horizon Report is actually the NMC Horizon Report. It's a collaboration between the New Media Consortium and the Educause Learning Initiative. So I really recommend this report. Every year it comes out and um, they gather experts from all over the world to essentially vote on what they think the latest technologies are and what's on the horizon and different time horizons. Just to give you a taste of what it is, here's a screenshot of part of their report from 2013. And they talk about key trends, significant challenges, and so on. And what I'm going to focus on is the time to adoption of one year or less. And you can see, for example, that massively open online courses, MOOCs, were on the horizon last year for one year or less. And so therefore, this year, it doesn't show up. MOOCs do not show up. So in the 2014 Horizon Report, the key trends that they reported for one to two years, which is where I'll be focusing this talk, they came up with social media and online, hybrid, and collaborative or peer learning. And then you'll see that they identified other trends over three to five years, data-driven learning and assessment, and students as consumers to students as creators. And then uh, after five years, the long-range trends are agile approaches to change and evolution of online learning. So I encourage you to go to the full report and um, read more detail.
So they also then talk about important developments in educational technology, again, with the three different time horizons. So for less than a year is the flip classroom and learning analytics. For two to three years, we have 3D printing and games and gamification. And four to five years, we have the quantified self and virtual assistants. So again, uh, for this talk, I'm concentrating on pedagogy trends of online, hybrid, and collaborative peer learning and the technology of the flipped classroom. And so what are the pedagogy trends? I guess you could talk about speech being one of the very early forms of learning. Uh, I guess you could call it S-learning, when speech was used to convey knowledge and information. And we move to W-learning or writing. You know, the uh, images here are the cave paintings and some Egyptian uh, characters uh, writing on basically, I guess, uh, Sanskrit. But uh, as you'll note here, teachers were even resistant to W learning. Socrates said, writing destroys the memory and weakens the mind. Hieronimo Scorsiofico in 1477 said that the abundance of books makes men less studious. So faculty are often resistant to the latest learning technologies. Now, um, I can't show you the full video here, but basically it's a very funny video. It's an ad for the L Pulse Smart Pen from Livescribe. So I give the link. Here. And basically it shows a frenetic uh, professor scribbling about the Krebs cycle on the blackboard very quickly and uh, the students looking very puzzled. So hopefully your lectures are not like that. So what we see in terms of the shifting pedagogy is that e-learning spectrum is shifting. And this slide sort of shows you the way that we're moving from more face-to-face -to, -face to more online. So even if you're doing all your teaching in a classroom these days, technology certainly is moving in. And so you could have pure classroom learning, technology-enabled learning, which I think most of us are familiar with when we have our learning management systems. And then hybrid or blended learning. And some would identify that if your education, if your course is 30% online to 80% online, that comes under hybrid or blended learning. And then basically you have classroom supported online learning where maybe once or twice a term, the students have to come uh, on campus to fully online learning. So in essence, we're flipping in sort of a grand scheme of things, we're flipping from face-to-face -to, -face to online, and this is sort of the long-term trend. So what happens when we increase pedagogical richness from just giving a presentation as a teacher to allowing students to practice and then having group activities and then real-world interactions and finally collaboration with the community? So this document or this diagram shows that these activities show an increase in pedagogical richness. I'm not going to have you go out to a poll, but just think about the best single word that describes what happens in a traditional classroom lecture. And I'll let you think about that for a moment, or you could pause it. Is this what happens? When I've done this in person at talks, Facebook is pretty prominent. This is, is this what happens? Sleeping? Uh, texting, Instagram, tweeting. So a lot of things happen in a, in a traditional lecture hall. Um, maybe little learning occurs, but you can see that unless you're really engaging the students, uh, it's very passive and they tend to do other things. So what is traditional education? Traditional education is a transfer of information and it basically happens in class. And this is the easy part when you come to think of it. The hard part is the assimilation of information. And this is what happens basically outside of the class. And this is the hard part. This is when the student spends a lot of time going over notes. Um, if they're lucky, uh, you know, maybe replaying a lecture using uh, lecture capture and so on. So this is traditional education. So what happens when we flip the classroom? So what is flipped education? Flipped education is where the transfer of information 
occurs outside of class. And this is the easy part, so to speak. This is, you know, reading the assignments, reading the chapters in the book, maybe watching videos, watching those captured lectures from the past. And then assimilation of information happens inside the class. And this is the hard part, certainly. I know a lot of you out there are experimenting with this and doing it, but it certainly takes a lot of effort from the faculty standpoint. Some would call this kind of setup peer instruction. So what is peer instruction? Peer instruction is you put a question out there to your students, you let them think, you give them time to think in class. Five minutes, it could be longer. Then you poll the students, and so they give their individual results. Now what? Now you let the students turn to their neighbor or maybe form a small group and let them discuss the question among themselves. And perhaps some students would try to convince their peers that they are right. So you give them some time to do this, and then you re-poll the same question. And when you do that, hopefully you'll see that more and more people have gotten it correct. And then the instructor or the guide does some explaining and, and we go to another question. So this really is the Socratic method in action. So think of something you really know how to do well. And I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. Think of something you really know how to do well. And then think of one word, a verb that comes to mind that enabled you to master that something. Okay? What do you come up with? Invariably, practice is the word that comes up. Read, learn, listen, study, look. Practice is certainly something that we all know. In order to master something, we have to practice. So practicing helps us to move up Bloom's taxonomy. Peer instruction helps us to move up Bloom's uh, taxonomy. If you're not familiar with that, certainly there's a link in my show notes. And we move from a lower order thinking, just remembering and recall, to understanding, to applying knowledge, to analyzing knowledge, to evaluating, and eventually to creating, design, build, and construct, and plan, and produce, and devise. So that's the higher ordered thinking. What happens if we stay with lower ordered thinking? Well, I don't know if you remember Father Guido Sarducci from the uh, Saturday Night Live fame, but he has a very funny video that, again, I can't show it to you here, but uh, the link is on my show notes. And basically he says he came up with the idea of a five minute university. And he teaches the students in five minutes what they're going to remember five years from the day they grad they normally would have graduated. Pretty funny. I can't do it justice, but uh, go and watch. It's, it's a hoot. So what year was the term peer instruction? In other words, classroom flipping. When was that coined? And if you uh, want to take part in our poll, again, go to rodspolspodcast.com slash p slash flipping dot html. So it was Eric Mazur who I called the godfather of flipping. In fact, um, I freely admit I borrowed some of the content or the ideas in my last couple slides from a talk that I've seen him give. He coined peer instruction in the 90s. And at the time, he used a homegrown wired audience response system at, uh, at Harvard University to teach physics. Uh, became very popular and very successful. In fact, he is on the board of Turning Technologies, which makes uh, turning turning point uh, audience response system that we use at the University of the Sciences. And he later founded uh, Learning Catalytics, which is another excellent audience response system. And uh, apparently it's been purchased by, uh, by Pearson. So Eric Mazur coined peer instruction in the 90s. 